Welcome to our second interview with the ex-Jehovah Witness group and some friends here. Orper Hicks is also part of the group, co-author of Bird's Eye View of the Bible. And we are back to talk again, uh, a follow-up to our last interview that we had about a year ago. And we've had great response to this. Many of you have uh, sent in questions. And so we want to uh, answer some of those questions uh, tonight on this video so we're going to get started uh, with the group and uh, why don't we go uh, first and just uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Betty over here and uh, just everybody introduce themselves brief briefly. I'm Betty Stevens and I'm Jean Eason. I'm Peggy Legg. I'm Orpha Hicks. I'm Tammy Moore. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, let's get to some of our questions that we've had some of our viewers uh, write in asking about our last interview, and we'll just take turns uh, answering those questions. So many of those who've uh, listened to the first interview uh, are confused about the joy and happiness that you now have in Jesus Christ. So could you please explain this joy and happiness that you currently enjoy as a Christian that you did not possess when you were Jehovah Witness. Who would like to go first? <laughs> well, I, for one, grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, there, everything was censored when I was a child. I wasn't allowed to read anything that was not uh, printed by Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I was not a not allowed to um, even associate with uh, generally with people who were not Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, it, everything was um, they expected you to uh, go out in their service preach their preach their doctrine but you could not compare it with anybody else's doctrine or uh, have any any choices you had no choices their choices were made for you, and they told you how you were going to live your life. They, they directed everything in regard to your life. They were in complete control. Uh, you couldn't ask questions. If, if um, today, uh, if I go to hear something in my church that, uh, it, uh, that I have questions about, if I want to go into it deeper or something, my, my minister has said, well, you come and talk to me about that. And we'll go into the theology of that. We'll go back into the Hebrew and the Greek, and we'll we'll have an understanding of this. You could not do that as a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, you were just you were told that you accepted their uh, their teaching. Uh, you did not question what they told you. So no question, no questioning of, of anything was ever allowed. No questioning. You accept, if they would give you a brief. Um, they would give you a brief explanation, and you, this was the, well, it, the, well, this is what the organization is directing us to do at this time. And whatever the organization said, you had to accept that, and uh, you, you had, they, they did your thinking for you. If you wanted to live a life, uh, if you wanted to go to college, or you wanted to study something in high school that they didn't approve of, they, um, you just you learned that that you would pay for those um, those times that that you questioned anything that they taught. So, did you believe that took away some of the joy uh, you had as growing up as a, a Jehovah Witness? I mean, it, was it as you describe it? You, you seem to be uh, describing a very sheltered environment. Uh, where you were t told what you could and could not do, and and did you ever, when you were in school with other uh, children, did that cause tension there? Did they, uh, could they, did they see you as happy or sad? How did how did other uh, people around you view you? Uh, were you joyful or happy, or what did other folks think about uh, uh, you as a Jehovah Witness? They could see that I was not, uh, and my teachers, I had teachers when I look back on it now, I, ha I know I had teachers that, uh, that knew I was not happy, but they didn't know how to reach out to me, uh, and I didn't know how to, to, to uh, talk to them. I was afraid that if I talked to them about anything that was going on in my life that it would eventually get back to my mother 
and who my father wasn't a Jehovah's Witness at the time, but my mother was a strong Jehovah's Witness, and anything that would have gotten back to her that I had questioned about the organization, or if I had talked to anybody out of the organization, like a counselor, that would have been that would have been traumatic. Now, would you have been disciplined for such actions, like you know, a spanking or strongly? Okay. Strongly, uh, you. Um, my mother threatened to make me quit high school if I did not. Uh, if if I thought anything different than the way the the witnesses were trying to uh, lead me, uh, she threatened to make me quit high school. That was one thing that she knew I wanted to to complete was high school, and uh, uh, that was one hammer she had on my head was. Uh, uh, what this one the controlling thing that she had uh, was that that if I could not uh, do what the organization felt I should do, that that uh, I could just quit high school. So, so growing up, did you did you uh, you were sensing that something wasn't quite right, or did you think this was just the normal uh, way that every child grew up? No, I knew it wasn't the way that every child grew up. I seen other students planning their lives. Uh, they were planning on going to college. They were uh, uh, their their parents were encouraging them to go to college. Uh, my parents, my mother, uh, was being led by other people in our local congregation that uh, my life was going to be different. My life was under their control. It was under their control. Uh, you're you're right there. You know where you go is controlled. Who you? Uh, I had one friend in high school that was not a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, we're we're still friends to this day. The Jehovah's Witnesses that I knew in high school no longer speak to me because I don't belong to that organization now. Now, are the Jehovah's Witnesses against higher learning? What well, what's you know you said that you you were not allowed to go to college even though you wanted to go to college. So explain to us. Uh, their understanding of, of higher learning or or is that only for the uh, the women or do the men get to go to college or explain please well in uh, the, the organization will say that they believe in higher learning and uh, uh, they there's articles uh, and I have one at home right now that it, it's uh, a watchtower that uh, is talking about college and they they tell you that well you're going to be associated with worldly people you're supposed to keep yourself away from worldly people anybody who's not a Jehovah's Witness is a worldly person to them they're bad influences they will draw you out of the truth they will influence you to do uh, to live a different life and thereby you will lose your everlasting life so they uh, they they will tell the public yes we believe in 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 college and and I know um, people right now who are going to their children are going to go to college because the organization their um, the organization has changed in 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 what they will put forth to people but when I was growing up that was the that was the uh, that was the that rule was the at that time that was the rule at that time. And in some areas, it still is. And uh, there are people who came into the organization who already had a college education. And those people see the importance of sending their children to college. But if you grew up in a family who didn't believe in a college education, those people still are still not believing in a college education, a lot of them. Okay, any other thoughts about... Uh the uh, childhood and the joys. Uh, Jean, were you, were you joyful? Uh, did you grow up in the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, or yeah. when did you? You know, I remember in high school, uh, when I came home with a schedule of what to, subjects to take in the, in the ju junior and senior year, but I said, well, there's no use taking foreign languages or any of those prep college courses because there's no time to go to college. Armageddon is right at our door. And I recall this was during World War II when I was in high school, and, and I remember we were being encouraged at the school, you know, to buy war bonds. And I can remember going home and talking to my mother about that, and she said, well, you just go back and you tell your teacher that this old government is just about ready to go down. 
that Armageddon is coming and uh, there's no need for buying any more bonds. Of course, they wouldn't have believed in it anyhow. So I remember telling my teacher that. And she said, well, the government goes down, everything else goes down with it, you tell her. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is it is embarrassing because, you know, you're, you're different, et cetera. Yeah. Now, as as growing up in in high school, did you have did you feel the pressures too uh, that uh, Peggy's talking about? Uh, uh, explain some of those. Well, uh, in high school, you you know they don't want you participating in any of the extracurricular activities and field service and out, going out is very important. And uh, we know now as Christians, you know we're to be led by the Holy Spirit. But when you're in an organization with Jehovah's Witnesses, you believe that the Holy Holy Spirit is an it, and uh, it guides the organization, and the organization tells us what to do. And so, like even going from house to house, your uh, your doorstep presentations are even prepared for you. Uh, there's nothing at all available to you of being guided by the Holy Spirit in the organization because, as Peggy said. Uh, they guide you. They tell you. You know. They tell you what. So, so every Jehovah Witnesses uh, that comes to the door has has, has a prepared plan, speech uh, mm -hmm. to present. Mm -hmm. There's nothing said very much off the cuff, as we might say. Right. And not only that, they have a book that uh, has all the answers. If the householder says th this or asks you this, this is what you say. So all the things are prepared for you and if they if you can't think of an answer right off that you're supposed to give then usually you turn to your little book and give them the answer everything it comes from the organization they are the truth they are the only ones that have the truth in the whole world there's no one else that has it except them and you are just uh, completely convinced that uh, they do have the truth and that the only way you can have eternal life is to stay with the organization and they control your, as Peggy says, they control your thoughts, they control your life. I remember uh, so well, Jerry, one time in 1945, they have additions and deletions as they go along. And uh, in 1945, their addition was uh, no blood, no, not to take a blood transfusion. Now, if you'd been a witness in 1944 and you took a blood transfusion, you wouldn't have thought anything about it. But I can remember what a big deal this was because it was new light. And they always are tickled to get new light. I mean, they, they're ready to accept it. And there was a man in our congregation that needed blood. And I can remember all the talk and how embarrassing it was for this man, you know, to have to explain this to the doctor in the hospitals. And uh, my grandfather, you know, was a witness. Both parents were witnesses. And, you know, I just recall hearing so many of these conversations in the home. I can tell you a little sideline about the blood transfusion. Uh, Jean and I was in the same uh, kingdom hall together, and uh, I was I was pregnant, expecting a baby, and I had not talked to my doctor about the blood transfusion because I, at the time, I wasn't sure whether he was supposed to or not. But anyway, after she my child was born, I was taking a blood transfusion. <laughs> Jean reported me. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> she wouldn't so, report herself. <laughs> <laughs> she she actually came to me and, and to make sure. She came to me and asked if I had taken one and I told her yes and uh, she reported me and <laughs> so I had to become I had to come before the congregation. The, the men in the congregation, elders. the elders or whatever, I forgot what they're called, <laughs> and uh, was put on probation. And for that's taking, the discipline that you were... Taking, mm -hmm, for taking a blood transfusion. Now probation, w explain that to some of our listeners who may not be familiar, were you not allowed to come to church? Did they oh, make no, you pay yes. a penalty fee or what did you have to do? <laughs> yes, I, I came to church. I don't think it was announced in the whole congregation, but they had told me that I was to report to uh, this one particular uh, man. And so when I did, he just kind of dismissed it and he says, you don't have to do that. Oh, okay. Well. So that was, that was, but this was a man that I had known since I was a teenager. 
Oh, okay. okay. Well, Jerry witnessed a snitch on each other all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're encouraged to do that because if you see a brother or sister sinning or d yeah. doing something they should not do, then you are supposed to, that's the way of court of them, that you right. to help them get back on the right road. Right. Right. Oh, okay, so they're, they're very... <laughs> That's their way of... They spy too. <laughs> they spy too, don't they? Oh, yes. Yes. oh my. But all this in hopes of helping the organization, as you and I know you never mentioned the word church. You know, I ha as we've been talking here, uh, the word uh, church uh, has, has not come up. You keep saying the organization. Why do you say organization and not church? Because that's that's what it was. It was an organization uh, of, of, of people that all over the world. They had them all over the world, but it was it was it was it wasn't a church. It was an organization that people had control over that lived in Brooklyn, New York. Was, and they didn't want to be called a church because no. they were opposed to churches. Oh, goodness, all yes. religions other than theirs are false and of the devil, so they are not about to be called a church. No. no. And as, and as Peggy, kids. I mean, you, so you didn't have any church, and none of you had any church friends when you were uh, growing up? Well, there would be acquaintances, you know, in your neighborhood or in your school, but they encourage you to make your close friends among Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Right. Yes. We mentioned a few moments ago about about the Holy Spirit, and you uh, mentioned it. And so, um, how is the Holy Spirit uh, uh, different? Uh, uh, compare it with the Jehovah Witness view of the Holy Spirit, and now the view that you hold currently about the Holy Spirit. And then we'll talk in a few moments about how the Holy Spirit uh, has impacted your lives. Well, like I said a while ago, the Holy Spirit is an it to them, but I had to. Uh, come to realize after coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses when I was in a, a Bible study to deprogram myself and uh, the scripture at um, 2 Corinthians uh, 1 Corinthians 6 19 the one that says do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who who not it who is in you whom you received from God you are not your own so when I did my study, I came to realize that the Holy Spirit is not an it, but he's a person. And when Jesus left, he promised us a comforter. And God created us for fellowship. And the Holy Spirit was given to us so that we could have a teacher to guide and direct us and fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in this way. So he is the one that guides us. How different this is from the organization when it's an it that tells the, organ, the men who write the literature for all Jehovah's Witnesses, they call themselves the faithful and discreet slave. And then they in turn, like I said, well, I'll go tell the Jehovah's Witnesses what to do. So Jesus is a mediator. Only Jesus is our mediator between God and mankind. We do not have an organization or a man or a group of men to be our mediator and tell us what to do. So we lie, as Christians now, we know that we rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us. So how has the Holy Spirit, since you have become Christians, uh, could you uh, just uh, share with some testimonies about how he's guided in your a new, uh, well, you've been Christians for many years now, <laughs> but uh, when you first came out of the Jehovah Witness, uh, t tell me about the experience with uh, the Holy Spirit and just share some personal testimonies along those lines. Well, I, I can tell you one. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses... <laughs> didn't throw anything away, like their literature, the books, or anything. I had not been associated with Jehovah's Witnesses for 17 years when I finally went into a church. And in the church, when you go in, you, 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 you know, you don't drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's, it's that fear, that fear, that fear, that fear that goes of you going into a church because you've been taught for so long how awful it is in a church. And so you you begin to know who Jesus is and what Jesus did for you. And so it's, it's entirely different than what the witnesses are saying. But there was a man that wanted literature. 
he was starting a ministry and of course I had literature stacked up in my closet. Wouldn't dare throw any of it away. So I, he wanted the literature and so I had sacks and I was throwing it down into the sacks and I heard this little voice say, Betty, who are you afraid of? And I said, Satan answered, answered the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And so I kept on throwing them in there until I got them out of my house. And it was, I realized that it was, that organization was not of God. Mm. So that's how I learned uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us and talks to us and he even tells us he likes us. Oh, he sure does, doesn't he? Yes. And Betty, you probably remember that we had a young man in our the church, the first church that we identified with, and he went to Asbury Seminary, and he told his apologetic teacher about us. And so the, his uh, professor uh, invited me to come over to the seminary and mm -hmm. speak to the, the, the students. I was absolutely scared out of my wits. <laughs> I thought, I cannot do that, but I just felt like that still small voice within me, this Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You promised that you would do anything. Mm -hmm. And I had told God that when I accepted mm -hmm. Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And so I knew that he would enable me. Mm -hmm. And I was really more fearful of not being obedient. See, I didn't need some man to tell me, yes, you need to do this. But the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit guided me to do that. And that was the beginning of being invited to more than 50 churches. <laughs> and then thereafter, when I was invited to come and be on the national television with John Ankerberg, but along with three other ex-witnesses, I thought, oh, Lord, I cannot be on the national TV. And again, you know, I just felt the Holy Spirit guiding me. That program ended up being appearing on TV in six different programs, and hundreds and hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses who just happened to be flipping through the stations who are not supposed to watch Christian TV and came out of the organization along with hundreds and hundreds of others who really kept them from going into the organization. And uh, then, you know, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to write my testimony book. I knew nothing about writing a book, um, but the, the Lord guided me, and that little book's been through three printings mm -hmm. all over the world, and it can still be read on our website, tutorsforchrist.org, if anybody wants to download it and read it. It's titled, Jehovah's Witness Finds the Truth, and um, and so was we had so many people getting in touch with us and asking questions that maybe we ended up starting a, a support group here in our home. We had as many as 25 people a week, you know, coming every week for a support group. So a ministry was dropped in my lap. I knew absolutely nothing about running a, a script uh, a ministry, and we we titled it uh, Tutors for Christ. And. Um, so we ended up, you know, being prompted also by the Holy Spirit to start having conferences here, uh, which helped uh, Christians to learn how to defend their faith against the false gospel. Mm -hmm. And um, and then a couple of years ago, I was prompted to write this book, uh, Bird's Eye View of the Bible, and with help that came to life. And so the biggest, the greatest joy that one can have is being obedient to the calling of the Lord. That is satisfying, and that brings joy. And just just little incidents in the Holy Spirit. There was one day I was getting ready to go somewhere, and I kept hearing, take your jacket. And so I was running around doing this and that and the other, and I'd take your jacket. And I thought, why would I want a jacket? The sun was out. <laughs> Finally, I says, okay, I'll take the jacket. And I, I'm... You know, it was the Holy Spirit telling me that, and it got so cold in the afternoon that I wish, <laughs> you know, I had been obedient, <laughs> obeyed quickly. And another time I was going down Manowar Boulevard to turn left onto Versailles Road, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, you're going to slide. And I did. But I didn't slide out in the middle of... Uh, Versailles Road, I got I got stopped. So he talks to us in just little ways all the time. You know that. Oh yes, yes. If but we have to be willing to listen. Yes. yes. Get get our focus off ourselves and mm -hmm. on to 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 and, and that's a promise in the word of God. Yes. 
Well, Peggy, want to share with us about uh, some of your experiences uh, about the, the Holy Spirit. Well, a friend had, at, uh, I worked with at uh, VA had uh, invited me to a fellowship dinner at a church. And I thought, oh, I didn't want to. Oh, she said, you don't have anything better to do. She said, come on, go. So I went to this fellowship dinner. And when I walked in there, I, I, I could just feel my mother's eyes on the back of my head. I could just feel that that. That, that fire, <laughs> I could just feel it. And I walked in there and, well, that was the friendliest bunch of people I had ever, I had met. And they were just the sweetest people and I started going back to church there. I start. I went on Sunday morning and and uh, I was going about, um, well, I, every Sunday, I, I couldn't wait for Sundays to come around. I'd, I, I'd go back and I'd listen to the, listen to the sermon and I would just feel I would just leave so happy and just full of hope and and there's there's something here I just kept feeling this this leading that there is something here for you so I remember I was making so many friends in this congregation and I thought you know, I, I've got to find out if this church has the truth or if the organization has the truth. And I remember standing in my home one morning praying to Jehovah, Lord, I, 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 Lord Jehovah, I need to know, is this church right or is this, or are Jehovah's Witnesses right? Because I'm beginning to like these people and it'll be hard if I have to leave this church. It's really going to tear my heart up if I have to leave. So. That morning I went to church and uh, sit down in uh, a pew and a, uh, there was nobody else sitting there. This lady happened to come up and sit down beside me and I had a book there about Jesus. And I had just prayed that morning about learning more about, about God and I said, I've got to know who you are. And I thought, well, I'll start with Jesus. Maybe that's, maybe that's what I need to, to learn about. I'll, I'll, I'll start here. And um, so... She said, oh, I've heard that that's a good study, but she said, we, ha we have a good uh, Sunday school across the, the hall. And I said, Sunday school? Well, I had gone to Sunday school as a little child. Uh, I didn't know anything about Sunday school for adults. Oh, she said, yes, we've got great Sunday school over here. She said, we start with a scripture, and she said, we know everything that's in that scripture, the total message that's in that scripture before we go on to a, another one. I said, oh, now, that's that deep deep study. I said, that's what I want. And she said, well, you may not want to come right now. She said, we're off on a little side study. And she said, we're studying the cults. We just finished with the Mormons this morning and next Sunday we're starting on Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the conductor of that, the, the leader of that Sunday school class was behind me. And she said, um, we don't know any Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't have any in the congregation. Nobody knows any. But Bob says that he thinks he's got enough information on Jehovah's Witnesses that, that he can prove that this, is a, that this is a cult. And I was just, I was, I couldn't speak. <laughs> I just could not speak. She said, she said, oh, she said, I must have had a, like a deer in a headlight look on my face because she said, oh, she said, I hope I didn't offend you in any way. <laughs> But I was in front of the class next week talking about what it was like to grow up as a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from there, uh, someone, in that, someone in that Sunday school class, she came up after uh, I had spoken about, what, about my childhood. And she said, oh, I've got a friend that was a Jehovah's Witness and she can be a lot of help to you. And that was this lady right here. So the next week she brought me up to Jean's and um, uh, then I, I was led to go look for myself, uh, I, go investigate for myself, go do research on, uh, on what Jehovah's Witnesses taught. And um, I went to, um, sem went to the seminary at uh, Asbury. And uh, they have a large library there that on the, all of the apostolic fathers and what, what Jehovah's Witnesses had taught 
Well, what they teach was started clear back in the, in the uh, uh, like the, around a year 100, mm -hmm. and it has just continued. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are not aware that that was being taught then. And there were a lot of um, church fathers that were uh, fighting that back then. Well, their writings are all recorded for us today. And when I went, we got about a half a page in the Watchtower magazine on supposedly some authority that uh, who turned out to be, um, uh, they say he was um, the, that, uh, the man in the Watchtower that uh, uh, wrote the book on the, the that, Byron's, Peter Byron's, like, no, uh, no, the, the, no, the, the first one that was out of the, the Watchtower magazine that, that, um, can you believe the Trinity? Uh, the, the Trinity magazine, mm -hmm. and uh, so he was a, a Unitarian minister. Well, they don't even believe in, but they were using this Unitarian's minister to support their their belief. And um, so when I when I got to looking at this, and and I went, so I went to, and I asked the lady there at the library. I said, I need to know where your books would be on the Apostolic Fathers' writings. She showed me this long line of books, huge, huge. I said, all of this is there, and we, and we got a half a page in the Watchtower. <laughs> I said, I've got to come make pictures of this. I just hope witnesses don't know that, that all of this is available. It was, it, the, but I asked the Lord to lead me, and he did. Uh, he, he, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, that, that Jesus, when, when he left, that he would send a comforter and a helper. And he's our counselor. He will guide us and to, to find the truth. And that's what the, the Lord led me to do was to, the Holy Spirit led me to go look at that for myself. Don't depend on somebody else's research. Go look for yourself. I had, and that's something that the Watchtower doesn't want us. And that's when you, you learned that the Watchtower on the Trinity had misquoted the early church fathers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and one of their quotes in there was actually from that Unitarian minister, which mm -hmm. they don't even think. Which,